Hey everyone, Elon here. All right. I invited Chris Bogan to speak as well. Uh, just to, it's intended to be a Starship uh, call, because so we've got the launch coming up tomorrow. There's a good chance that it gets postponed, since we're going to be pretty careful about if it does go wrong, it's a lot to go wrong. Starship is uh, the biggest rocket uh, ever made, over twice the thrust of a Saturn V, the Saturn V moon rocket, which is the largest rocket ever to get to orbit, roughly twice the mass. Got uh, 33 engines on the booster, got six engines on the upper stage of the ship. Uh, so it's a lot of engines. <laughs> So I, I would I would I guess uh, like to just set expectations uh, low. <laughs> you know, if, if we if we get far enough away from the launch pad before something goes wrong, then I, I I think I would consider that to be a success. Just don't blow up the launch pad. Let's see. Hey, Chris. Hey, Elon. How are you feeling for tomorrow? What's your predictions, really? Because it's a big ask, isn't it? It's thirty-three engines, ninety percent. For six seconds, then launch commit. Do you really think that it's got a good chance of launching first time, or maybe you'll take a few attempts? Uh, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Is I think the the probability of us triggering a launch abort is on the since it's the first launch of a new rocket. We've actually never launched the booster before. We've test fired the booster, but we've not launched it. So the the chances of us <coughs> triggering an abort um, and having to postpone the launch are high. That's why I want to. You know, just set expectations appropriately. This is not like a, you know, some sort of uh, train leaving the station at precisely like, you know, nine oh three a.m. or something like that. It's, <laughs> you know, it's the uh, the first launch of a very complicated, gigantic rocket. It might launch tomorrow, but if but we're going to be very careful, and if we see anything that gives us concern, we'll postpone the launch. Uh, if we do launch, I uh, would consider anything. That gets that that does not result in the destruction of the launch mount itself, the, the launch uh, launch pad uh, stage zero. Effectively, I would consider that to be a win. It, that that may sound like uh, you know I don't know like low expectations or something, but it's worth bearing in mind that the the Russian N one rocket, which is the probably the closest comparison to Starship, was had a string of failures, never reached orbit, and that was when the Soviet Union was at peak rocket capability with the A-team with maximum stick, maximum carrot, meaning like you would be hero of the Soviet Union if you succeeded and off to the gulag if you don't. So maximum motivation with the A-plus team, they still failed. It's worth you know keeping that perspective. So it may, it may take us a few kicks at the can here before we reach orbit, and then beyond reaching orbit, we've got to bring the booster back uh, and land. We've got to bring the ship back and land. And, uh, you know, we in order for the reusability to be rapid, it's got to land where it took off because transporting this gigantic beast around is is extremely difficult. So it's got to land. <laughs> it's got to basically land back on the Megazilla arms, and it's got to do. And then all of this has got to be accomplished while still keeping payload to a useful orbit significantly above zero. We're not like the first ones to think of the idea of reusability. Obviously, everyone was aware of reusability from the beginning of orbital rocket days, but it's it's just a staggeringly difficult technical issue. We live on a planet where it's barely possible. Like this, if this was a video, video game, it would be set to a level of difficulty just below impossible. I mean, many people in the public may not realize that rockets are actually, <laughs> those big complicated rockets are thrown away every time they fly, with the exception of Falcon 9. Where the, Falcon 9 is a weird one that comes back and lands. Uh, but we lose the upper stage and we have to catch the fairing far out to sea. And even the, the boost stage, we usually have to land downrange. You know, a lot of people think like a rocket goes up and and uh, then gravity stops at a certain point, but, uh, but that's not actually the case. If you look at a long exposure, you'll see that there's a, an arc to the rocket flight. Um, you actually only go up vertical for a short period of time, and then you, you do a gravity turn, you sort of tilt over, and then you start going horizontal to the Earth's surface. So what matters is that you're, for getting to orbit is your velocity parallel to the Earth's surface. Um, it's an imperfect analogy, but like like tetherball, uh, you know, the, the ball stays horizontal if it's going really fast, or a ball in a roulette wheel. It's it's sort of when the outward acceleration equals the inward acceleration. The outward acceleration due to motion equals the inward acceleration due to gravity. That's when you experience zero gravity. Anyway, it's going to arc out to sea. 
Yeah, but we, we got this is a, this is really kind of like the, the the sort of first step in a very long journey that will require many many flights. If for those that have followed the history of Falcon Nine and or Falcon One actually our, and our attempts at reusability, if you really add them all up, I mean, I think it might have been like on the close to twenty attempts before we actually recovered a a, a stage, and then it, it took many more flights before we, we had reusability that was meaningful where we didn't have to rebuild the whole rocket now the the, the falcon 9 team is you know a real kick-ass team i mean they're just making it look easy relatively speaking uh launching you know every four days or so this just to you know give you a sense of what the falcon 9 team is hopefully accomplishing this year is you know if we, if we do close to like 90 launches maybe 100 with an average of 17 ton, metric tons to a useful orbit, that's an important part because sometimes you'll hear these payload to orbit numbers, but they'll be to an orbit that's um, not useful. A useful orbit would be one where we can uh, take Starlink satellites. That would be a useful orbit. Where, where can, what, what orbit can we drop them off at? So that means you know probably on the order of 1,600 tons to orbit this year. The rest of all, all the rest of the rockets on Earth this year will probably do three or 400 tons. Just Falcon 9 will do 80% of all Earth mass to orbit this year, assuming there aren't any major things that go wrong. I think China's like 10 or, Chris, you may know this better than I do, but like 10 or 12%, and then the rest of Earth is like 8%. Yeah, it's absolutely dominating. And it's an interesting thing, because listening to you talk, there's so many tie-ins there. You talk about Falcon 9, they're all coming back, one after the other. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's, becoming- it's, I hate using the word routine because you can't use the word routine in spaceflight. But they're all coming back one by one. And you've got people who've worked on that Falcon 9 recovery who are now working in Starship like Lars Blackmore. These are like genius-level people you've got working there. And that gives you confidence in maybe Starship will have some, you know, it'll have some challenges, but eventually it might work. And then you've got all these boosters and ships down the road at the production site just lining up ready to go. It's, and you've got the evolution with, with Booster 9, haven't you? So it's like whatever happens with Booster 7, you can get improvements automatically with Booster 9. So you've got like an evolution path where it's not like other rockets where if they launch and they fail, they've got like a big downtime before they get the next one ready. You've got them all lined up down the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, for those listening, I mean, I, you know, I apologize. Like sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll dip in and out of like extreme rocket wonk stuff uh, to – I'm, I'm I'm trying to address things on the level of someone who who doesn't know how rockets work, but is curious um, and 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 like level nine wizardry. <laughs> you know, it's a mixture. Some of this is going to sound like Greek. I mean, to your point, uh, Chris. Um, the, we, we, actually, the funny thing is, like, we're, we're actually dying to get this rocket off, no matter what happens to it, because there are so many improvements between booster seven and booster nine, uh, literally hundreds. And I mean, for example, like some major ones, like we, we, we moved from hy- hydraulic uh, thrust vector control to uh, electric uh, from booster seven to booster nine. You know, the, 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 the entire heat shield structure on the, on the base of booster nine is completely redesigned for booster seven. So booster seven has uh, kind of a retrofitted heat shield system between the engines. And this is very important because if you, I think about it, if you have 33 engines and if any one of them goes wrong, it's like a do- it's like it's, it's like having a box of grenades, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, a really big grenades, and so if, if if one of those grenades goes off, you don't want the other grenades to go off too. But we have to retrofit the the, the heat shield, the, the sort of blast shielding essentially, and heat shield. It's, it's both blast shielding and heat shielding um, at the base of Booster Seven. Uh, we realized that the initial shielding that we had was just way too weak, so we've taken that Booster Seven apart, put it back together again, so many times. It is an artisanal rocket, uh, artis- artisanary at scale. We, we just wanted to take off and, and, and move on to booster nine. Uh, there's, there's still a lot to learn, of course. Uh, you know, this is also a, a sort of fully autogenous rocket, so which means we're using gasified uh, oxygen to pressurize the oxygen tank, gas gasified methane to get to pressurize the methane tank. It is a, a tricky situation because if you uh, the, the, the gas is trying to liquefy as you're, you know, as, as, as you're, tr- you're trying to pressurize a, a thing with its own gas. Naturally, it wants to, to to cool and 
what's what's called the ullage, the pressure and gas in the in the tanks. It wants to it wants to cool down and shrink as quickly as possible. You're you're sort of filling it while it's condensing at the same time. How those relative rates work is remains to be seen because we've not done that with, with either the ship or the booster or with full tanks. There's a question of will the engines be able to provide enough pressure and gas to keep the uh, the booster and the ship pressurized? You know, remains to be seen. But we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get good data either way, even if it doesn't work uh, as well as we had hoped. There are a number, many improvements in the in the valves throughout the vehicle. You know, it's it's it's, it's always tricky when you want to have a valve work across a wide temperature range. So you can design a valve that's going to work at really cold temperature. Or a valve that'll work at, at hot temperature, but it's really hard to design a valve that'll work from all the way from cryo to to hot. You know, there's a million ways this rocket could fail. I could go on for hours. What but, would you say? What would you say? Would you, if it does succeed? I mean, I'm talking probably like gets past Max Q, maybe staging. That'd be a massive win. Let's face it. Massive win. Massive win. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> if you get to there, though, but if you get even further, will you be thinking maybe chopstick catches in three or four attempts time or? Are we are we getting a, a bit ahead of ourselves there? Depends on how well that the, these launches go. It, it's an easier move to try to catch the booster. You know, the booster, the booster, like that's obviously a thing we've done before, uh, albeit not with chopsticks. When you think about like ground safety, because we're obviously very, we want to be very careful about not endangering anyone on the on the ground. The booster can boost back to the launch pad, and with with a very you know relatively small. Um, landing ellipse so you're not really you, you can boost back and, and not overfly populated areas but for the ship uh now you've got a much harder problem because you're coming in it's kind of like the space shuttle you're coming in over the united states you know so so we, we've got to make sure that the ship can land accurately uh, get through um max heating and max heating is extreme is extreme like this thing's coming in like the ship is coming in like a meteor it's blazing hot so does the, does the heat shield work? This is a big question. I mean, we, I think the heat shield, like the, we know the heat tiles work, but if, if we have gapping in the tiles or uh, the, the 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 hot gas seal at the flaps is is, is a quite a dangerous place. That's where the you know the the, the hinge point of the flaps for the front and rear flaps. Um, it's really difficult to achieve a hot gas seal there because you, you've got something that's moving. You know the the flap hinge is rotating, but you got to stop stop uh, hot gas from getting through there. Then relight the engines and land. Um, it's a lot a lot to be done. So, I'm, so I'm, we'll, sure, I'm sure the people want to talk. I don't dominate the time of this proper reports like Kristen Davenport on here as well. Uh, so I'll just simply say, yeah, look, yeah, I, yeah, I it's, really it's, sincerely. I mean, I'm, I've got to be an objective reporter, but you, you know, honestly, let's we all hope it works. We all wish it the best. We all wish your team the best. And it's an ex- it's it's really for humanity because it's such an exciting rocky, what it can do, the capabilities of it. I'll tell you what, while I'm talking to Elon, <laughs> t- if people want to DM me questions, I'll ask Elon the questions you want to ask. <laughs> That'd be one way of doing it. Um, until someone else comes on, I was going to, I've got a quick query about KSC Starship. You've got 39A, you got the tower built. Are you still looking at LC49? Uh, yeah, we, we, we've got... We built the launch tower at uh, 39A, um, and uh, but before we you know do launches from there, we've got to have redundancy for crew. Uh, so that, that we're building out um, the ability to launch crew from Pad 40 at the Cape. Um, now that doesn't give us redundancy against Falcon Heavy though. So. It's like if something goes like, like we want to use the Cape for uh, kind of operational launches as opposed to developmental. Um, yeah. Especially if if you got the launch pad, you know the if you got, if you got the Starship launch pad right, you know, pretty close to the you know Falcon Falcon Heavy launch pad. Uh, if something goes wrong, it's going to be some downtime. So, um, so we, we want to kind of get past the developmental stage uh, here at Starbase before we um, launch out of the Cape. Excellent. I found John Krause. I've now got the ability to invite people to try to speak. John, can you um, speak and confirm you've got the ability to speak? He's definitely been invited. Yes, I tap that like mic icon on the lower left. 
Yeah, John, if you can hear us, um, it's a little thing on the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, Mike is on, just type that to make sure it comes on. Hey, do you have me now? There yeah. we go. Oh, cool. Yeah, I was kind of just listening in, enjoying the conversation. Um, I think the one thing I'd ask is, like, there's kind of that famous phrase, um, always go to 11. Um, Elon, could you speak in what that's referenced to with Falcon and, like, what are the things you look at, you know, going into tomorrow? What is the 11th thing, if you will? The, the 11th thing is obviously, it's sort of, you know, partly referenced to Spinal Tap, but uh, the... <clears throat> The second flight of Falcon 1, the 11th risk was um, a coupling of the slosh modes of the upper stage uh, liquid oxygen tank with the control frequency of the engine. Um, and uh, I'd asked for the top 10 risks at the time. And I was actually kind of worried about that coupling, but I didn't see it on the top 10 list. And I saw uh, risks, so I thought, well, okay. <laughs> so now we ask for the 11 in, in each department the top 11 risks <laughs> actually more than that people there's no real limit um but uh <laughs> there's, there's volume goes to 11 which is like you know louder than loud from spinal tap and then there's like damn if we'd if i'd asked for the, the 11th risks we you know uh, i would have maybe may, may, would have maybe taken some action on the it got into orbit sooner with falcon one so that's where that comes from um, if you ask me, like, what what my biggest concern is about uh, this this launch, um, you know, I I I say this, this the concerns are similar to what the you know the Soviet uh, N1 rocket uh, faced, which is like you got a lot of engines, uh, there's stage combustion, so it's high pressure, very high pressure engines, very high performance engines. Uh, if one of them does let go, um, there's a domino into does it does it take out in, uh, the the other engines or the stage or the launch pad, which case very bad day. Um, that would be my biggest concern is, uh, is losing an engine that cascades into loss of the loss of the launch pad is really the thing we're concerned about. Um, so if, if we if, if we uh, love the launch pad and it's really much more of a fireball than it is an explosion, but it's a very big fireball and it'll it'll melt the steel. And, and, and slag the launch pad. So uh, it would take us uh, probably several months to rebuild the launch pad if, if, we, if we melt it. Uh, the, so my top hope is please uh, may fate smile upon us and we clear the launch pad before anything goes wrong. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, N1 N blew up with the launch pad. <laughs> One yeah, one several times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've also added um, Ellie in space because I know she'll ask you some good questions about Starship. Hey, Ellie, if you can speak. You're on. Can you there hear me? Hey. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Elon. First of all, thanks for hosting this space. This is really great. Um, and I was just curious in the midterm, what is the priority with Starship to develop and demonstrate refueling capability, work on the HLS variant, or are you just in general still proving the concept? No, I, I think I, I'm just like I said, I, I really want to lower expectations as much as possible here um, and use as, as an example the, you know, the Soviet N1 um, rocket, which, was, it, it, which is really the closest rocket comparable to Starship. And, and Starship is in some ways uh, more risky than the, the N1. It's a lot more thrust. It's running a higher chamber pressure. It's a full flow stage combustion, and it's got a cryogenic fuel. Um, Cryogenic fuel uh, has the added risk of gas of fuel gasifying and forming a fuel air, you know, a fuel oxygen pocket, which then it's a, you know, if, it, if 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 you get a, a fuel ox pocket forming that that lights off, it's it's a gigantic boom. Um, so it, like like even if even if it happened in an engine compartment, um, it would really be quite uh, quite bad. Now we do have. Um, we are running nitrogen purge on the you know, like as as much as we possibly can on the um, engines that you know on the launch pad, and then we have a CO two purge in flight, so that should mitigate the risk. Uh, but it you know you, you you can if if the engines the engines can always leak faster than you can purge 
so that's po possible. And then you, you can, um, like I said, get, get a, a few other, that few other combination and that is the curtains. So this is, it's, it's a very risky flight. This is not, uh, something that is a, a sure thing at all. Um, I guess um, I'm just wondering in the next few months, if we see a successful flight, you know, what happens next? Yeah, I, 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 I think I just need to set expectations that, uh, that it probably won't be. Um, and maybe the second one will be, and maybe, or maybe the third one will be, but probably tomorrow will not be successful. Uh, if, if by success, one means reaching orbit. Um, this is not to say that there's, like, there's something we're aware of, that if there was something we were aware of, we would deal with it. But there isn't anything we're aware of. It's just a very fundamentally difficult thing. Like that's why I preface it by saying that the Soviet uh, rocket engineers, which really was was the entire Warsaw Pact, frankly, um, uh, their, their combined capabilities still resulted in failure, despite maximum motivation, and they were the A team. Um, so just please set your expectations appropriately. That is what success is not what should be expected tomorrow. Um, that, that would be insane. So, uh, but we've made a number of improvements with it. Anyway, I, I, I <clears throat> sorry. And I, I will need to go back to work uh, shortly. So, um, the, what, what, what actually matters here is the, the, the fact that we are, we are building rockets at a rapid pace so we've we've got booster nine ship 26 um almost ready to go and we have a steady cadence of rocket production afterwards and with significant improvements between each uh, iteration of the rockets um so you can think of the the the, the, the payload for, for this mission is information uh information that allows us to improve the design of um future uh, starship builds. That is our only goal. If we get any information that allows us to improve the design of, of uh, upcoming builds of starship, then it is a success. It is purely inf purely learning. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really what matters here. Um, now, in, in the long term, so it's so difficult to predict what will happen between now and then. Um, in, in the, the long, long run, long run meaning, I don't know, two or three years, um, we, we, sh we should achieve full and rapid reusability. Um, but the physics of this design allow, allow for that um, in a way that Falcon 9 does not. Um, because we've got much higher performance engines, it's a, there's, some econ there's some economies of scale. Um, and... Um, we're using a, a propellant that is a higher ISP. So, um, but full and rapid reusability will, will mean that the, the cost of a Starship flight will be less than the cost of an expendable Falcon 1. Um, so meaning maybe it's a few mil a million dollars per flight or a few million dollars per flight or something like that. If you have a high flight rate, and you have full and rapid reusability. Even a rocket the size of Starship might, you know, might might be a million dollars a flight or something. So, um, which is kind of boggles the mind. Um, and it, and then and you combine that with orbital refilling, um, which requires a, sort of a ship docking with a ship, which we we know how to do because we've figured out docking with Dragon. And if we're docking with ourselves, that's way easier than docking with the space station. Um, so, so I th like the exciting thing I think is that this is this is an actual path to being a multi-planet civilization. Like that's that success. That the fact that success is one of the possible outcomes is the amazing thing. Um, now we need to make it from being one of the possible outcomes to actually being probable. That's very difficult. Um, so we've got an arduous, I don't know, two or three years ahead of us. Um, with probably, you know, many bumps on the road, but at the end of that, it sh we, sh we should have something that enables, uh, a base on the moon and uh, a base on Mars. Um, and we really, really are designing this for just a, for an extremely high mass flux to this, to the moon and Mars. Uh, and it, you know, you can do both. Um, 
So, um, but you really need an, an immense amount of mass. Um, you know, rough order of magnitude, probably, you know, 5 million tons to useful load to Earth orbit to get to a million useful tons to Mars surface, um, which is probably, probably what you need for a self-sustaining civilization. And in order to um, pass uh, the <clears throat> great filter effectively, uh, sort of a, one of the sort of Fermi, Fermi paradox great filters, which is all we are multi-planet species or not, the Mars has to be self-sustaining, which, which means if, if the ships stop coming for any reason whatsoever, Mars must not die out. That's the that's the, really the, the threshold. And then the, we as a civilization need to achieve that threshold before uh, global thermonuclear warfare or, or any other kind of uh, event that eradicates uh, civilization. That's the essential test. Um, so which comes first? Uh, you know, hopefully there's never World War III, but uh, there might be. Um, and or, or, or it could also be the case that civilization gradually subsides um, and dies, you know, in a, in a whimper with adult diapers instead of with a bang. But either way, we, we, we've, we've got to make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> and and we are at this brief moment in civilization where it is possible to become a multi-planet species. And uh, hopefully that window stays, stays open long enough for us to, to actually do it. Um, that's our goal. Um, yeah. I think we've got a chance, but it's not uh, dicey. Hey, Elon, this is uh, Joey. Can you hear me? Yeah, Joey from Reuters. Yeah. Um, yeah, just real quick. I guess this goes back to Ellie's question. Um, what what kind of testing cadence are you expecting after this mission? I guess either in the scenario that something blows up along the way, or if it's flawless. Um, you know, how many more missions? I guess before we see some real hardware going to space. Thanks. I'm just saying we we don't know. Uh, this this vehicle could make it all the way to orbit, or or it may blow up on the pad. So. I would encourage people to review the history of the uh, Soviet N1 uh, rocket. It was really a, a very impressive rocket design, um, and uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, they but ne never reached orbit. And one of the missions uh, blew up the entire pad. Um, so it, we don't know if we knew we would take action. Uh, but I reviewed everything with the team today, and no nobody can think of anything that would make a big difference to our probability of success. So we, therefore we must move forward and give it our best shot. Um, Have you gotten any yeah. clarity, I guess, on the costs that you're targeting for building these things once it gets into a production rate? Um, and how much did this particular uh, Starship system cost to build, if you can, if you know? Uh, it, it doesn't really actually matter what this particular vehicle cost. Um, It'd be, be a bit like saying, like, if you've got a, say, a, a, a soap factory, what did your first bar of soap cost? Well, $10 million. But that's not actually what the bar of soap costs, because what matters is what does it cost at volume production. Um, so, the, 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 and, and then if you've got a fully reusable rocket, now, now you're not throwing it away every time. So, the, 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 if you're not throwing it away every time, then you, what matters is your cost of propellant. Um, now, our rocket is uh, methane oxygen, roughly 23% methane by mass, um, you know, 77% oxygen, and we want to actually try to maybe push the oxygen percentage a little higher. So it's mostly it's mostly oxygen, um, and um, and and the, the cost of liquid oxygen is roughly the cost of electricity. So because you just pull it out of the air and liquefy it, uh, methane is the cheapest fuel that exists. So it's you know, you, one could th get the cost of propellant in theory well below half a million dollars. And then it's like, well, how many flights do you have and what's the refurbishment cost per flight? If it and then how often do you fly? That determines the, how, you divide the capital cost by how many times you fly. Um, so I mean, we see a path to, at volume, you know, on the order of a million or two million dollars per flight total or total cost um, for over a hundred metric tons to orbit. And then, now, the, the, these are like absurdly good numbers by historical standards. You know, to, to get a to, to even have to, for it to even be remotely possible uh, to do a hundred tons for a million bucks 
to orbit fully, you know, that's just boggles the mind, frankly. It's so far beyond. But 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 the, the important thing is that 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 is one of the possible outcomes. Uh, so uh, for for other rocket designs, there are several orders of magnitude away from that, um, and that is and that is not one of the possible outcomes for the other rocket designs. <laughs> so, you know, for any given endeavor, you should always ask: Is success in the set of possible outcomes? <laughs> if not, you've got a real problem. At least in this case, it is in the set. Um, now, then once it is in the set of possibilities, then you work on improving the probability. Um, gotcha. Yeah. And about the, the orbital refueling <laughs> tests, what kind of, I guess, testing timeline do you imagine with that? Do you do that in parallel to other types of tests, or when should we, I guess, expect those? Well, we've, 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 we're not going to try to refill. And I, I use the word refill because uh, technically... It's um, mostly oxygen that we're transporting up there. Um, it's, you know, call it, you know, what I said, r roughly 77% oxygen, 23% fuel. Um, you know, at the point at which the, we, these things are, are going up and coming down reliably, that, that's when we uh, aim to do orbital refilling. Good afternoon, Elon. Uh, just a quick question here. This is Austin Assister from Everyday Astronaut. Um, in terms of, of uh, your uh, launch tomorrow, can you share, obviously, the, the payload bay door as well did shut, but did you guys put anything in there? Obviously, we've had a history of some interesting items on uh, inaugural launches. And then what made uh, what helped you get to the decision to not try to attempt to soft land uh, Ship 24 near Hawaii since Booster 7 is uh, doing a boost back burn and doing that uh, in the Gulf? Thanks. Uh, there isn't any possibility of, of landing sh of the ship. Um, soft landing it so this that would mean putting legs on it put legs on it you change the you shift the center of gravity the center of mass rearward um and uh then you have to put ballast in the in the, in the forward section um so it's it's really it's not a simple matter to try to land it somewhere the what what matters is like it looks like said so that we need to set expectations low if it gets to orbit, that's a massive success. That's more than the, the best Soviet, the smartest Soviet engineers could do at the height of their powers um, with maximum motivation. That, that, and they they weren't aiming for, well, they, at least their initial iteration was not, re, re, the N1 was not a reusable rocket. This one is. Like, so we, we've, we've got a few years to go before we can count on reusability. And, and, and just, and, to, just to round it off here, for, for tomorrow specifically and, and whatever other times, what are the biggest factors holding that up and what are kind of the biggest things you're worried about going into that performance wise and uh, just success wise? Obviously you mentioned earlier that, you know, clearing the tower, getting off is, is a big win. Um, but are there anything that you're pretty concerned about going into it? I mean, I have a concern list a mile long. Like I said, I, I, my main concern is that when we light the engines, um, that we didn't, that, that the engines, uh, not knowing the engines um, explode, um, and that if one does explode, that it, it's contained and does not uh, domino into the other engines or the stage. That's the you've got thirty three engines that all need to work, um, or if they do, if one does not work, that it does not to cause the destruction of the of the vehicle. Um, that's that's all, that's really all I'm concerned about here, um, and and it's then and the, the then the it needs to get far enough away from the launch pad such that if it, something does go wrong, it does not cause destruction of the launch pad. That is, that's it. Um, and anything above that is, uh, I'll be jumping for joy. So, <laughs> I think a lot of us will be jumping for joy. I'm, maybe I can ask a final question for you, Elon. This is Zach from uh, CSI Starbase. I feel like I've watched very, very closely over the last uh, two or three years, and you know, I like to be critical just to like let people know like what's going on because I feel like sometimes there's a lot of like misunderstanding of what's actually happening out there. And I guess I won't ask you like too technical of a question, but I guess based on like what you initially thought was going to be the biggest hurdle, like what was the actual largest hurdle to get this first launch underway? Because obviously there was tons of like GSE issues, tons of like actual vehicle issues you know structural 
and um, structural qualification testing. But like, if you had to pick out of all of the things that you guys came up against leading up to this biggest day, like what was the hardest thing to get over in order to reach tomorrow morning at 7 a.m.? You know, it's hard to say which, which is the hardest because it's sort of what's it's kind of like what's the hardest or what's the hardest relative to expectations. I, I suppose that, you know, if I wanted to pick one thing, it's, it would be the engines. We had to do a complete redesign of the Raptor engine um, because it was um, just, just Raptor 1 was simply not reliable. Um, and uh, it, 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 almost impossible to make. So a complete redo of the Raptor engine for Raptor 2, probably the single base thing. That, that, that set us back six to nine months probably. And, and then we we had a lot of a lot more challenges with the ground system, which is uh, underappreciated because it seems like you know it's, it's like well it's just a, the ground system that's not so hard, but actually the ground system is is very difficult. I, I promise you that I I appreciate it. I've noticed every single change along the way, and it's been interesting. I mean, just from my point of view, it seems like it, most recently you guys definitely drastically increase the amount of sensors in order to like, you know, make sure that everything goes flawlessly. I feel like a lot of people don't really like <laughs> appreciate the amount of changes that you guys made over the last few months in order to kind of make this go off flawlessly. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like the GSE just doesn't get covered enough overall, like even from SpaceX, like letting people know like what's all involved in just getting this off the ground. So, um, I don't know if you have like any comments on just like a, a huge thing that you wish didn't happen leading up to this or something like that. GSE related. I can't really think of one like single thing. Um, I mean, I, I guess in retrospect, we should have gone with kind of relatively off the shelf vacuum jacketed um, horizontal sure. tank Thanks. or propellant yeah. instead of you know, trying to kind of make our own um you know, we call them like the hot dogs, the the, the big horizontal vacuum jacketed tanks. Right. Um, so probably should have gotten gone with those instead of trying to build our own. Uh, but but I, I would like to just say that the the importance of the ground site is really it's just as important as the boost stage and the ship. So you can think of like, like I call the the ground side stage zero. Um, and if you get stage zero wrong. Uh, then, that, that, then, then you're going to have the worst day of all, you know, where you, you blow up the launch stand and the uh, rocket. So, <clears throat> get, getting getting the ground <laughs> ground side uh, working well, because um, the ground side is also controlling. You know, like when you start up the rocket, uh, the ground side is is what's controlling the the abort. So, if, if if you have an issue with the the engines or the stage or anything like that. Um, and you've got to, you know, detank and 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 save the the stand. Then you're reliant upon your stage zero, your ground your ground equipment to keep keep the whole thing safe, uh, and all the, the software and logic that goes with it. So, um, just trying to plug big plug for just the stage zero. Um, even though it doesn't fly, it's just as important as stage one and two. So, all right, with that, uh, I, I got to get back to work, guys. So. Hey, if, if I can, just one quick question. What do you think the chances are this thing actually lights up and launches tomorrow? Or do you think there's the higher chance of a scrub? It's more likely to scrub than not. Than Go to Tuesday and Wednesday, or do you think there might be some longer scrub? I don't know. Depends on okay, the issue. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Elon.